Welcome to our regular Friday night talk series on breaking myths. First, a short introduction to the speaker. Dr. Punia Wong is an associate professor in internal medicine at the Monash University of Malaysia. He has been sharing Dharma regularly in Malaysia, Singapore, Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh City, and Bangkok in the last decade. Let us now invite our Sing Se, Dr. Punia Wong, for the 17th talk in the series entitled The Price, Hugger, and the Price, the Cost of Compassion. Dr. Punia Wong, over to you. Good evening, Dhamma family. Tonight, I would like to dedicate this sharing to the memory of two precious Dhamma Dutta workers, our family in Jakarta, who have passed away due to COVID-19. It is very sad that at this junction, COVID-19 in our own country is also in a very bad state. And the numbers in the Klang Valley today are shocking. So I'd like to begin by saying, let us all be safe. Let us stay at home. Strongly advise not to go out to your kampongs during Chinese New Year because for our own safety, for the safety of other people, we must not allow this virus to spread further. We also recall today is the death anniversary of a young late brother, Sin Xiang, to whom the book was dedicated to. And of course, we have also Madam Ong who passed away today. And we too would like to dedicate the merits of this sharing to all these people. Today I'm talking about the price and the price of compassion. You know, all of us have some degree of compassion, wisdom, self-awareness. The Buddha is a being who has developed his compassion, his wisdom, his self-awareness to the greatest degree. When Sister Hui Shan bows down in respect to the Buddha image, she is not bowing down to a stone statue or bronze statue or glass statue or porcelain statue. But instead, Sister Hui Shan is bowing down to the qualities that are represented by that image. The qualities of compassion, wisdom, mindfulness, self-awareness to which Sister Hui Shan would like to cultivate in herself. She is in truth bowing down to her potential self, her potential future. Now, compassionate requires, any compassionate deed requires metta which is of course unconditional infinite love. And compassion arises when we either have conscious or unconscious awareness that everyone around us, the one who is suffering, the one who is enjoying life, the one who is in comfort and the one who is sick, we are all interconnected. And this concept of duality of I versus you is a delusion. Compassion includes without distinction when you understand emptiness, all beings. And while most of us are familiar with compassion as an act of giving someone something, compassion is actually expressed in our daily lives throughout our actions, thoughts, speech, even hearing and of course, giving and receiving. Compassion is made up of two words, co and passion, quite self-explanatory. And when we see someone in distress, when we see, for example, a person in pain or in illness, 
we feel it, we have empathy, and we want to relieve it. That is compassion. And you know, all the best in us, all the so called Buddha like qualities like generosity, sympathy, etc., they are manifestations of compassion in various forms. Now we talk of parameters, supreme, the highest. And of course, there's this concept of dana parameter, whereby it is the perfection of generosity, of giving, where in this act, the person who gives is not concerned about him being the giver, and neither is he thinking about what am I going to get from this receiver. It is truly selfless generosity. And for this reason, you will notice that when the monks and the nuns go on arms round, they do so silently, and they do not say thank you very much, they just give you a blessing. So giving and receiving, of course, is interrelated. You cannot have one without the other. Neither is one superior to another. Now, Karuna is one of the four divine abodes, along with loving kindness, joy, and equanimity. Something I think most of us in this audience is familiar with. The Buddha wants us to cultivate these four virtuous mental states. And when our minds are clear of the delusion of separateness, when we remove greed, hatred, then the mind naturally rests in this divine abode. You literally stay in this noble abode, this noble house. And this is the noble house where your mental state it's one of loving kindness, compassion, celebration, and equanimity. Cultivating all four are equally important, as I will show. Now, karuna is the desire to remove your suffering when I can perceive, when I empathize with your suffering. Metta is a desire to bring you well-being, happiness, and we too similarly feel joy, mudita, when you are happy, or when I've made someone feel happier. Again, I repeat, metta and karuna are verbs. They are not nouns. We have to act on it. Now, we are all familiar with this. It describes the Buddha teaching us. But the important line is the line that I've outlined in bright yellow. He did that out of compassion for the world, for the good, welfare, and happiness of devas and humans. And the challenge given to us is to have boundless love towards the entire world without question. Now, please remember, when we say, may all beings be happy and well, this includes ourselves. The Buddha did not teach us to make other people happy and we ourselves miserable. He said, may all beings be happy and well. And it is important that in making people happy, you include yourself as people. So for example, if I meet any one of you, you will very likely offer me a nice cup of tea and the best food in your town or kampong because you are kind to me or you respect me. So you must even be kinder to yourself. It will be preposterous that you are kind to other people and unkind to yourself. So respect yourself and offer the best to yourself too. I do not think that Dr. Quack will feel guilty on offering me a cup of nice coffee. 
So why should you feel guilty offering yourself a nice cup of coffee or tea? Sometimes we forget that and we put ourselves in a difficult situation. Now, please remember Dhamma family, the path of the Buddha makes us happy. As you walk this path, you become happy as you understand the truths of life and adapt to it, we become happier than before. So a very important milestone in our progress is are we becoming more happy? You should be if you are walking this path correctly. Now, when we teach people or show people compassion, words, are not very useful. It must be taught by action. And I, I must say that if we are to ask people about an impression they have on Buddhism, most people will associate compassionate acts with the Buddha Dharma. Now, our country is again in crisis. We went through all of this last March, April that was a genuine lockdown and people were stuck everywhere. And brothers and sisters in the Dharma sent food to those who were stuck in their hostels, in their rooms, etc. I think that that is probably the best way of actually teaching what is metta, what is karuna, what is compassion. Now we are again in a sad state, and I think it behoves on us to do whatever we can to relieve the suffering of our fellow human beings in whatever little way that is within our means. Actually, giving material things is the simplest. And of course, dana is the antidote to greed. We overcome our greed by being generous. And in giving, it is not just the giving of material things. It is also the giving of our knowledge, our skills, and most important, the Dhamma, of course. But to do this requires that you give your time. All of this requires that we give our time. And time is something also very, very precious. I can give you a kick. I can always buy another kick. I can give you knowledge. I can read up someone. But once I have given you my time, that is gone forever. And for all of us, time is a commodity that is ever decreasing. Skills. Many of us have some form of skills. My hosts for this series of talks have a lot of talent in information technology. They are the ones who got all the 16 groups linked together. They get all these talks cross stream to all these groups. And for that, I am eternally grateful to them. It has been my aspiration, my wish, my hope that all the Buddhist societies can get together, sit together, share the Dhamma together. And for far too many years in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, we are scattered into so many little groups that are in communicado with each other. So it is great compassion that this IT team works hard every week and get all of us together in one voice. And here, of course, you have a cartoon. Charlie Brown asking Snoopy, go get a shower, go help me. And Snoopy brings a big machine that can do the job much easier. He has a special skill. Now, let us be aware that even in keeping the precepts we are practicing compassion. 
we just took the five precepts. In taking the precept of restraining from harming, the first precept, you are actually practicing compassion. In not taking things that doesn't belong to us, in abstaining from sexual misconduct, etc. Every one of these is an act of compassion. It is not just for ourselves. It is also for other people. When we keep our precepts, we are also helping other people. So by abstaining from running around unnecessarily, we are also helping both ourselves and other people. Even something stated in the fourth precept, Musawada, which is not just talking about lies, but even about the manner we speak, even that is compassion. And of course, many of you are aware that lots of people speak to their plants and then the plants bloom beautifully. Imagine that if talking to plants can make them bloom beautifully, what will talking to a nice, in a nice way to a fellow human achieve? Much more. Now, most of us are involved in some form of voluntary work. It is also important for us to realize that when we are involved in some form of voluntary work, we must be adequately equipped or trained for it. Sometimes we do not realize how inadequate we are. A senior counselor at my university in one of the sessions that we attend to learn how to talk to people actually taught me that when we are talking to people who are distressed or in grief, not to say things like, oh, don't worry, oh, cheer up, oh, everything is going to be all right, because that is not reality. The reality is the opposite for that person. So when we say things like that, in our very naive attempt to help, we may actually be doing more harm. And of course, this came to me as a surprise because it is quite intuitive for almost all of us to use words like this. And hence, I realized that for any form of effective voluntary work, whether it is IT work or secretarial work or leading a society, we need to be trained so that we are equipped to manage that. It is not something in the old days where chin chai chin chai anyway, anyhow goes. Of course, as we mentioned, dana parami, a true generosity is giving without any ulterior motive, springing from our heart, out of meta, out of the realization that we are all interconnected. It is not, I'm giving so that my children will have better results, or I'm giving so that I will strike lottery, or I'm giving 10,000, but I will get back maybe 30,000 somehow. That is not dana, certainly not close to dana parami. That is an investment. Now, it is important when we are involved in voluntary work, works of compassion. And, you know, as we were waiting just now, BGF, for example, have counseling courses, etc., etc. Sakya Inn has very impressive programs where they go and provide food to elderly people living alone. They even had a program where they feed poor people for free. You just got to come and line up at Sakya Inn and you can collect free food. And recently, even thinking of starting animal shelters. All fantastic deeds of compassion. But you will realize that some days will be very good. Some days you will have a lot of difficulties. And we must always not be too obsessed with how did I do today? Stay positive, stay strong, 
very importantly, as I said, right at the very beginning, make sure you are included in that compassion. When all is done, go home, rest and forget it. No one can ask for more. In the Heart Sutra, we say, Wu zi yi wu de, yi wu suo de gu. You don't have to bother about how much you have attained or achieved. Sing wu guo ai, wu guo ai gu, wu yu kong gu. Then your mind will not be burdened by all this. Have I done it? Have I not done it? How much have I gained? How much have I achieved? Just do your best without thinking about how much I have achieved. Drop the I from the equation. The price of compassion can be quite high. Many of my students who are now doctors are frontliners. At my last visit to Malacca, I met up with one, two, three, four, five of them. All five are frontliners. Young people dressed in their PPEs, struggling every day. And of course, all over the country, there are many of them. They pay a high price for this compassionate act. One of the ex-students, a good Buddhist, told me that yes, doctor, we do our best. But every day when I go home, I worry because I live with elderly parents. So yes, we want to do lots of these compassionate acts, whether voluntarily or because of our vocation. We must always also have to take care of ourselves. So our frontliners, we have to be very grateful for them, to them, because they are putting their lives on the line. And this is a serious thing. My classmate, who is a GP in Johor Bahru, tells me that on the average, he sees three patients a day. He picks up three patients a day with this. So it is real Dhamma family. It is real. And the frontliners are compassionately offering their skills, their knowledge, their time, as I mentioned. And one of the things a very senior leader taught me when I was discussing with him about this is that he taught me that there's a difference between mission versus choice. A lot of our voluntary work is by choice. For that, when we are really down, we walk out. But a lot of it, he said, is mission. Mission, for example, of these young doctors. They cannot walk out. It is now up to their leaders to realize that so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so are now very badly affected and we have to rotate them, take them out, etc. Because they cannot say no. Now, compassion satisfaction is our price, Z-E, P-R-I-Z-E. -E. We feel good when we do good work, when we have positive relationship with our leaders, fellow workers, or fellow volunteers. And most importantly, in volunteerism, feeling that what we do makes a difference. If people have this feeling that what I'm doing is not making any difference, all will give up. So love and compassion are necessities for the person to whom we are trying to help, but they are also necessities for the volunteer. We all need it. If not, we can't survive. And of course, for those of us who are volunteering, compassion can be used to heal ourselves too. Because when you see other people's problems, you realize how blessed you are. You realize how lucky, how unfortunate you are. Again, as an example, when I met my five frontliner students in Malacca, they were telling me all their woes. And then one of them realized, but we are very grateful, you know, at least we got jobs because my parents who are in the tour industry in Malacca effectively have zero income now. So you he or two realize he had the insight 
that yeah, despite all this, we are very, very blessed. So we're always thankful for what we have because many people have nothing. But prolonged exposure in any form of continuous exposure to suffering, pain, emotional scenes will cause compassion fatigue and burnout. Now, this is a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion caused by long-term involvement in emotionally demanding situations. It's precipitated by the delivery of care to people who are constantly suffering or repeatedly bearing witness to suffering. Sometimes it can be so bad that exposure to just one victim, for example, a horrible victim of war or rape, it can cause an emotional scar. So that's why leaders, for example, in missions, the frontliners have to be rotated because if not, they will break down. And similarly, for those of you in voluntarism, you have to take breaks. If not, it's not the physical exhaustion which tears you, it's the emotional and mental exhaustion. This is the trajectory. And it is like our Malaysian roads managed by JKR. We all start off as zealots. We are going to save the world. And then you realize you can barely save yourself. And that the work is tough. We become irritable, frustrated, withdrawn. And after a while, even doctors become zombies and some give up. So any one of us here, and I'm sure many of us are, who are involved in voluntary work or missions, do watch out for indicators of compassion, fatigue, emotional breakdown, or sing more, the Mara within your mind the demon within your mind. And this can manifest in many ways. So we have to be mindful and look at ourselves. And if we can see ourselves starting to question the meaning of our life, our work, or this career that I chose, or we start questioning religious teachings, anger, skepticism, hope, loss of hopes, then you know that you are on the verge of emotional breakdown and that these singmo or maras within your mind are overcoming you. And I've seen excellent young doctors give up because of this. They leave their careers. Sad, but true. So we have to learn how to recognize and manage compassion fatigue. No doubt, the work that we all do in voluntarism or now in Malaysia managing COVID is hard. So we have to take care of ourselves and if necessary, take a break. You can always come back. And as I said, for the leaders, you must be aware of this. And for those frontliners, you have to rotate them. Unfortunately, Managing compassion fatigue is not as simple as just saying, here, take this nice bottle of juice, drink it, and you will have compassion. Unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. So we must be aware. I know lots of you are involved in every center that I've been to. I see good Dhamma brothers and sisters involved in one way or other in such voluntary work. So... The gladians are very involved, the DDs, the Jedis, the list goes on. But be mindful that not only are you changing people's lives in helping them, they are also changing your lives. And sometimes we forget that. And we have to realize that no matter what we do, things will never be perfect. So we have to accept imperfection. So rejoice in the perfect imperfection. 
be it our work, relationships, personal lives, it will never be perfect. That is the first noble truth. So our wife, our husband is good enough. We are far from perfect, both of us. So we are very well matched. That is Ajahn Brahm's advice for us. Wonderful advice. Two perfectly imperfect people. Now, the older generation here would have played with kaleidoscope when you are young. I do not know if our young generation, Sister Hui Shan's generation may have played with a kaleidoscope. But a kaleidoscope is basically a tube with many mirrors at its side on the inside. And right in the middle are broken glasses of various colors. And so as you rotate them and you look through one end, you will see beautiful images caused by the reflection on the mirrors. So there is beauty, even in imperfection. It need not have to be perfect. All volunteers try our best to keep our lives in balance. And of course, this will require that your voluntarism mustn't be 24 hours such that you're completely immersed in it. Anyone will break down because we are dealing with emotionally demanding situations. I see counselors among you all. Sister Barbara Yen is here. You know, Sister Barbara Yen was a counselor when I was a medical student in the University of Malaya, in University Hospital. And I see that even BGF offers counseling services. When you are a counselor, people pour out all their problems to you. I hardly ever see happy people come and see a counselor and say, I've got nothing wrong with me. I just come to say hello to you. Most people come with issues. And so unless you've got a big hole somewhere where all these issues that come in can be poured out, if you are to retain these issues, it's going to affect us negatively. And hence, the issue of privacy, the fact that Sister Barbara and all the other counselors cannot even ventilate to another person despite all the other people ventilating to them, makes it emotionally even more bottled up. And hence, they have to really realize that they need a big hole somewhere where it can be poured away. And that the fact that their personal lives must be separate from their voluntarism or work. Or else it can be not only just very lonely, but quite emotionally devastating. So when we are no longer able to change the situation, we have to change ourselves. That's what Wonder Woman said. And so we need self-care with activities that give us pleasure, joy, diversion. This relieves the intensity of our voluntarism or our mission. And here we must follow what the airlines always tells us in an emergency Put your own oxygen mask on first. Now we all take showers every day. So similarly, our mind needs to be refreshed daily too. Feeding our minds with things that clarify our mission. It could be reading uplifting material, biographies, devotional things. All the while, watch out for signs or warning symptoms. Here is a cartoon showing insomnia at 3.20 a.m. in the morning and the black dog. I will describe a little bit about the black dog later. So we have to be mindful, introspect, and see whether we are developing compassion, fatigue. And you know, as doctors, patient, I have a headache. And in the doctor's mind, an immediate thought shoots out. Of course, he doesn't express it. But in his mind, he's so fed up, he said, I hope you die. You know that he has reached the age he cannot carry on anymore. Compassion, fatigue has set in. 
And I received this in my email as I was preparing this talk. This email sent to me tells me that you have people who will push your button, drain your energy, etc., etc. They are so negative, they will destroy you. And they are telling you, stop letting that difficult person or behavior ruin your day. But the reality is, life is as described in the first noble truth. There will always be stress. There will always be association with people you love and association with people that somehow get on your nerves. There will always be dissociation with people you love to. So we have to learn how to handle this. We have to be selective with our battles. Sometimes peace is better than being right because the price that is being paid may perhaps be too high. And very often, a lot of conflicts is because the same thing is seen by two or three different people from different perspectives, and they see it differently. For example, here you see this. But if you put your finger across the middle, you will find that this color and this color is the same. Try it. Put your finger across this middle. You'll find that this and this finger, sorry, this and this color is actually the same. So our rights and our wrongs may be completely just a matter of perspective and conditions. Now, of course, I mentioned earlier about leaders. The frontliners have to be rotated. They have to be given breaks. Or in volunteerism, you need to inspire them. You have, of course, plenty of qualities of poor leaders versus good leaders. Good leaders work on the goodwill. He's able to motivate, generate. He can fix whatever goes wrong. He actually leads by example. He develops people, not use people. And he doesn't take credit for himself, but gives credit to others and say, let's go, not go. So these are things which all of us will see, read, study, if you are interested, on leadership. And as I said, we need even training for such things. I think very few of us are born with such qualities. And it is important for patrons, leaders, organizers, head of departments, admin, to realize that not only have your frontliners and volunteers to be rotated, they have to be treated well and like gold. And one way is, of course, feed them. Feed them. A close friend of mine who had spent literally decades in voluntary work taught me a long time ago that fellowship and meals are crucially important to sustain the esprit de corps, the spirit, enthusiasm, devotion, and strong regard for the activities of the volunteer group. So not only must they be united by a vision to help, they also need in their quest to help activities which they enjoy. And in our Malaysian, Singapore, Indonesian culture, food is something all of us have in common. I think we have to ask ourselves, why do we choose this calling? Why do we continue even when exhausted? Do we regret anything? And very importantly, are we becoming a better or a worse person in pursuing this work or volunteer work or mission? Leaders must have the ability to motivate workers, motivate volunteers, because that makes all the difference. The older generation will recognize this man. He is Winston Churchill. He is the leader of Great Britain during World War II. And at one time, he stood alone fighting the might of Nazi Germany, when Nazi Germany was all conquering. Only the island of Britain was left. And many of you will have seen the movie, The Darkest Hour, etc. And he has this amazing ability 
to motivate people. And he said, you know, if you can motivate people, they can go to hell and actually look forward to the trip. For us as Dhamma family, we can find strength in the Dhamma. We can find strength in the fact that we are grateful for so many things. And so we are using our time to give back a little. As mentioned, Winston Churchill was Britain's leader in World War II. He was put on his shoulders, his mission to save Britain from the might of Nazi Germany. And it is actually the English language which won the war because it was Winston Churchill's mastery of the English language that managed to motivate his people, not just his soldiers, but the public, the population to rally behind him and fight. But how many of us here realize or know that Winston Churchill suffered severely from depression during World War II? And I can well imagine why to save the soldiers at Dunkirk, for example, he ordered one battalion to fight the Germans on another front. And it was literally suicidal. That whole battalion was sacrificed to save those at Dunkirk. And how many of you realize that Churchill ordered the sinking of the French fleet? The French Navy was a very powerful Navy. And Churchill was obsessed that if Hitler is to take over those battleships, Britain is finished. So he ordered his British Navy to go beside the French Navy, a friend and an ally, and sink them. It was a slaughter. And millions died in India as Churchill diverted food from India to his soldiers fighting the war in Europe. How can anyone even go to sleep at night when you have done things like that to win the war? So Churchill suffered from severe depression. He had this demon which haunted him and he called it his black dog. And you know, Churchill is what we call a functional alcoholic. To overcome his depression, he did his work zealously and he drank huge amounts of alcohol. He's almost never without a cup of brandy or whiskey in his hand. But he found this demon, this Mara, to be like a black dog that follows him everywhere he goes. And when the black dog is present, everything looks black. And here he say, my black dog seems quite away from me now. Such a relief. All the colors come back into the picture. So for him, it's a mission. He cannot walk away. But we have to recognize all this or the work that we do might change us into what we most fear about. So we need these thoughts. We are only responsible for our task. You have a mission or a choice. For many of us, it's a choice. So you're only responsible for your task. And you're not Superman. You cannot solve the world's problems. And the need will always be greater than the resources available. Sekia In can feed many, many poor people. But I can guarantee, Brother Tan, the number of poor people in Malacca will overwhelm the resources of Sekia In. So we can only value small victories. Mudita. That's why mudita is so important. Value whatever small victories, rejoice in them. This is the price. And remember, their pain is not our pain. Don't take it home with us. Equanimity, upeka. And this is extremely important for our mental health. That's why we need to develop all the four Brahma Viharas. 
in voluntarism, you will see poverty, you will see abuse, you see illnesses, those who run hospices, etc., trauma, death. But you must not allow ourselves to be captured by the demons of depression, hopelessness, fear, and loneliness. The very thing that you're trying to relieve. And hence, we have this English expression in fighting the demon. You must not become the very demon that you are fighting against. If not, the price, CE, will be too high. So let us turn away from the fault-finding mind and see the positive, the mudita, the joyful aspect. And here you have a nice t-shirt. My husband has a wonderful wife. Aha, that's very positive. Do any one of you have such a t-shirt? Well, I have one. My wife has a wonderful, awesome husband. Rejoice at every little occasion. Every little voluntary work, we rejoice. Every little success, no matter how small, we rejoice. Grateful for every little blessing for we know the realities of life. Now I want you to do an exercise. Every one of us, name three things you feel grateful for today. Think silently in your mind, three things that you feel grateful for today. I'm grateful for meals despite COVID-19. I'm grateful for good friends, we communicate every day to boost each other's spirits up. And I'm grateful that I'm still alive and healthy. What are your three things? Think of something that has brought us a sense of joy. What made you laugh? Make up the top five list. What is it? A joke your colleague made? Something nice your children say? Or something you received? I received a nice Chinese New Year present from one of my students who is working as a doctor today. That brought me a lot of joy because I can sense, aha, I'm not like a used tissue paper to be thrown away. At least someone values that tissue paper, etc. Who do we love that you can reach out to today? Do you text them? Did you WhatsApp them? It could be something so simple. I ate Hokkien Mee for dinner. Do you text it to your friends to let them know, to your family to let them know that you are okay, that you're still enjoying your meals? So what made you laugh today? Do share it with us. Recall these things even in our worst days, and then we put some joy, some hope, some laughter, and some gratitude. Life is too short to be serious all the time, let us see the funny side of life. The relationship between husband and wife is very psychological. One is psycho and the other is logical. Try not to figure out which is which in my relationship. Now, in summary, let us help oneself. Let us help others because this is what the Buddha Dharma teaches us. Ultimately, you know that in helping oneself, you're helping others. In helping others, you're helping oneself. That line is getting more and more blurred. There's a big difference between money and time. We know how much money we have, but we never know how much time we have. So let us use that time well. And how? Well, just be a good person. Meta who you can, help where you can, give what you can. All the time, be introspective, make sure we are not becoming worse by doing what we are doing. To save a starfish, this is the starfish principle that I shared once when I was invited by a Rotary Club. And many of you are familiar with this story. Uh, old man was walking along the beach and there were plenty of starfishes that were washed up. 
there was this boy who was picking up a starfish and throwing back into the sea. And the old man asked the young man, there are probably hundreds of starfishes on this beach. How many can you save by doing what you're doing? And the young boy replied, well, I saved that one. And he threw it. So we can save a starfish. We cannot save all starfishes. Mudita for that one starfish. Upeka for all the other starfishes. Metta karuna is what we are practicing. And remember, you cannot drink from an empty cup. So make sure that you are not emotionally exhausted, drained. Make sure you do not develop compassion fatigue. Make sure that you treat yourself as well as you treat those that you wish to help. Make sure, Brother Dr. Quack, that you give yourself that cup of tea at the same time as you give me my cup of tea. You cannot drink from an empty cup. We need to fill ourselves up. And remember, may all beings be happy and well, includes you, includes me, include all of us. Thank you, brothers and sisters. I again repeat, we wish to dedicate the merits of tonight's sharing to two dear sisters in the Dhamma, to Dhamma Dutta workers in Jakarta, a mother and a daughter who passed away because of COVID-19. Dhamma Dutta workers are very precious. We lost two, but we are very sure that all the good work that they have done will help them have a better rebirth. Today is the death anniversary of the late brother Sin Siang. We also remember him. Let us share merits, dedicate merits with him. The book, Breaking Myths, was in fact dedicated to his memory. And we have Madame Ong, a mother of one of our DDs who has also passed away today. We recall her as well, and we share merits with her as well. May all of them be happy, healthy, and well. Brother Bobby, thank you, and Sadhu. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for the very uh, pertinent, very useful message today. <clears throat> Dr. Wong mentioned about the importance of caring for ourselves as we are also people. And, and uh, he talks a lot about compassion means caring for ourselves, which is what Acham Brahm also used to say. Acham Brahm says, as doctors, he sometimes counsels, he says, the doctor's job is not to save lives, but to care for the patients as best they can. So let us start with a question from Sister Judy Pearl Ang from Taiping Insight Meditation Society. Sir, can you explain an example how to be kind to ourselves? How to be kind to ourselves? Sister Judy, first, I will say, please take care of yourself as well as you take care of another person. Sometimes we see that we actually treat other people better than we treat ourselves. Sometimes we see that we ourselves become the victims of our zest to lead a life that is very simple, while we are not applying that same principle to our guests. So I would say, one, dana not to outsiders alone, but dana to yourself too, so that you can have a happy life. Remember for lay people, the Buddha gave us the happiness of freedom from debt, the happiness of enjoying what your righteous wealth can get for you, the happiness of spending and making your family comfortable. And that of course includes yourself. So one, Dana to yourself. Sila is also a form of being kind to yourself because when you practice Sila, we are actually being very kind to our self of tomorrow, the next day, the next week, the next year. When we practice Sila, we are planting causes for happiness. We are avoiding the causes of Dukkha. 
So you're being very kind to yourself when you keep your precepts because by making sure you do not plan the causes of unhappiness, you are saving your future self of one week later, two months later, one year later from much unhappiness. So be kind to yourself, give yourself time, give yourself activities that you can enjoy, give yourself quiet time. I think it's important that every day we give ourselves a little bit of quiet time. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, question follow up from uh, Putra Heights Buddhist Society. Brother Kowei Kien says, Dr. Wong, last week in your talk, you mentioned the duty of the medical profession. The first principle of a doctor's oath is premium don no sir. First, do no harm. Ironically, modern medicine tends to violate this principle by developing technologies that assist in harming or ending lives. For instance, in uh, abortion and euthanasia. Even so-called Buddhists are deceived by this message of modern medicine. Many believe that they are being compassionate in ending lives that are no longer worth living. Yet, this is in fact a false compassion. How might we educate Buddhists to help in realizing the importance of the first precept and appreciate the value of human life? Well, Brother Kaur, first and foremost, next week will be a talk dedicated to this. So it's actually hosted by Putra Heights and it will be on death and dying. And I'll just talk about this a little bit tonight. The first principle of medicine is first do no harm. Primum non nocere. That means even if you can't help, you do not harm. And in the Hippocratic Oath, it specifically, for example, states that doctors must not provide help to people to abort a child. And there are also other things that I will talk about next week, for example, on the fact of modern medicine being able to extend life because of life-saving machines. And you mentioned about euthanasia in your question, that is, that is another huge topic by itself. Um, euthanasia, it's a big topic that can be a whole talk by itself. But let me put it this way. First, Things are never dogmatic. It is never in black or in white. It is never a line that is drawn that says, this is wrong and this is right. Because there are very often areas which are gray. The principle that does not deviate is the fact that you must first do no harm and that in whatever activities you are doing, we are doing to help, not to harm. So questions like euthanasia had been asked many, many times at many levels. And the question is always one. You must understand that from the medical viewpoint, it is only in the last 30, 40 years that there are many ways in which life can be extended through support ventilatory support, cardiac support, aortic pump support. Up to about 30, 40 years ago, people died natural death. That means the disease process will take its course and the person dies. So when you talk of euthanasia, there are various forms of euthanasia. Active euthanasia is where somebody actually gives something and let a person die. All right, that's active euthanasia. It's banned in most countries. Only a few countries actually allow it. And even that under very strict conditions. So if you are to ask yourself, even in those countries that allow it, Malaysia does not allow it. Even in those countries that allow it, what is the aim? Is the aim to kill or is the aim to relieve pain? to relieve suffering in something that is inevitable. For example, if somebody now is terminally ill, Mr. A is terminally ill, and I'm asked by the family, what do you think, Dr. Wong? You look at the person and you know that the person is terminally ill. 
The family knows that he's terminally ill. Maybe even the patient knows that he's terminally ill. Are we going to go all out to do everything just to extend his life by one week and make him suffer and bankrupt the family? I would say we have to use our wisdom. We are not extending life. We are extending the dying process and that is wrong. We extend life as doctors. We do not extend the dying process. So we have to use our wisdom. And as I said, there are many, many situations in which these principles are applied. So if you are very dogmatic and say, no, I will not lift a finger to kill anything, then I will say that, well, in that situation, if you see a child that has heavy worm infestation with a big belly, are you going to sit back and say, no, I'm not going to do anything because it is the karma of the child to have all this worm infestation? then I will say that very likely you are a bit too dogmatic and you're perhaps not very wise. Because what is my aim? My aim is to save the child. My aim is a purpose of saving a higher being. And I would deworm that child, etc. So as I said, there are many, many messages that can be discussed and debated along these lines. But the principle of panatipata is not killing. The principle of panatipata is harming. As I've shared before, panatipata comes from the word apata, breeding. Any being that has breeding. And of course, if you look at modern science now, even the vegetable briefs, they have respiration. Panati is to harm. So you do not harm anything that has respiration. Killing is only one end of the spectrum. So what is the principle is we do not want to harm. We want to help. And I think that a very, very important concept in Buddha's Dhamma is wisdom. Let me give you another example, brother. In the Vinaya is the record of one monk. As he was walking past the forest, he saw, I can't remember whether it's a deer or a wild boar, that was caught in a trap, okay? So this monk saw the animal being caught in the trap. And out of compassion, he released this animal from that trap. The person who set the trap complained to the Buddha. And he said, by the rules of the Vinaya, this monk has to be defrocked because he has done a dina dana with a value exceeding that that requires him to be disrobed. But the Buddha, when he looked at the situation, said, no, he doesn't have to do it because why did he release that animal? His intention is not a dina dana. His intention is to help. And so we have to use our wisdom. Even precepts, they are training rules. They are not commandments. There are no commandments in Buddhism. And I can go on with many, many examples, but I think that it is Sufficient for tonight, because this is not the main topic for tonight, all right? In modern medicine, doctors are trained to save lives. Doctors are not trained to help people die. So when you put a young doctor and you ask him that this patient is dying, you are to care for this patient who is dying. And unless this doctor had further training and palliative care, many of them are lost because they only know how to do whatever they can to prolong his life. When you are told, let him die a natural death, many of them are stuck. So it's a big feel in itself. Um, of course, there are some people who may be intentionally doing things wrong, but I believe that most people are basically compassionate. Their idea is to help, not to harm. Okay, Bobby? Yeah, Dr. Pudia, uh, Brother Ko further clarified that this question was specifically about educating Buddhists, more, being more concerned about activity of education rather than morality or legality of the acts of abortion or euthanasia. Isn't that the same thing, educating Buddhists and that? Isn't that basically we educating them on the first precept, Murder Bobby? Or do I misunderstand the question? Uh, Brother Kaur, you get back to us if you are still, still not happy with the question. We'll proceed with the, uh, the next question with uh, Sister Jeanette Ang. 
from BGF. How to overcome compassion fatigue in taking care of challenging family members like autistic, Alzheimer's and other conditions? Yeah, it's difficult. I can tell you it's very difficult. I had relatives with Alzheimer's and I can tell you it's, it is very, very difficult. So as I said, you need to give them a break. They are like the frontliners. If you do not rotate them, that means if you do not give the caregiver a holiday, the caregiver will break down and no one can keep on doing that. So the caregiver must be given a holiday. The caregiver must also be cared for. And of course, in situations like people having autistic children, it is a mission. You don't have a choice. It is not a choice that you can walk out of. So you need support of Kayana meters, friends, etc., to help. Because if not, you will break down. Because people, when being exposed to long durations of very emotionally demanding situations, you will slowly, slowly have what I described earlier. You start questioning, you start asking yourself, what am I doing? And then the whole circle of the black dog will start coming in. You know, I have an aunt. The husband, my uncle, suffered from dementia near the end and she was taking care. And I can tell you it's very, very difficult taking care of someone who is demented. And she used to jokingly tell us that if murder is not a crime, she would have murdered him. But of course, that was said in a joke way. Because I, we can all understand how difficult it is to take care of someone who basically doesn't want you to take care of him. He, he thinks he's all right. He does all kinds of things which would be socially inappropriate. And it is very, very exhausting for the caregiver because it's a 24-hour job. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Question from TBCM uh, Facebook. But the Onchan asking, just wondering, what if the patient is really suffering or has specifically said that he or she wants that option and not be prolonged? Well, as I said, all of you must attend next week's talk because this is on that. And I'll again just answer it briefly here. Please, every one of us here, everyone, I don't care how old you are, please write out what we call an advanced medical directive. Write it out, okay, very clearly stating what you want because it is important. It helps your family make a decision. No doctor can intubate you or put you on life support without the consent of either yourself or your family. No one can. If you have expressively said no, no one can put you on life support. So the question always that doctors face, and here I change hat, put back my doctor's hat, is that when it comes to the crux, families cannot decide. You got five brothers and sisters, all five will be having five different opinions and they cannot decide what to do. And it puts everyone in a difficult situation. So the old man or the old lady ends up having intubation, put on life support, and then it well goes on for a longer period. Let's hope the person recovers. So do make an advanced medical directive. I will be sending it to Hui Shan, an example of an advanced medical directive so that she can post it up for everybody. And in an advanced medical directive, which I have written one for myself and gave to my daughter who is a lawyer, I actually tell you exactly what I want down to the details of what I want for my funeral, who I want to conduct my funeral. If I want Bobby to conduct my funeral, I state that I want Bobby to conduct for my funeral. I want durian puffs to be served during my wake, etc. And it's very clearly stated there, what do I want? Should I ever reach a time when I am to be put on life support? Yes, no, etc. All the details are to be specified. I repeat, no doctor can put you on life support if you had clearly said, I do not want, and your family members are aware because that would be considered assault. The usual problem is the family members cannot decide. A more difficult question is taking off life support. That is an even more difficult question. That means a person is on life support and the person dies, brain death. Now, the family will be asked, do you want us to take off life support? And that is a more difficult situation because you are already stuck in there. 
all right? If the patient had clearly expressed his views on whether he or she in old age wants to be on life support, then it is clear. The doctors before they put you on will ask you and you can clearly say, no, my, late, my father has clearly expressed that he does not want and that is the end of the question. Bobby, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wong. Felicia, I think Dr. Wong has just answered your question also. A question from BGF, Alessandra Chin. How do you see stillness versus excessive compassion? Should compassion be positioned in a level of not too excessive? Well, as I said, you need all the four qualities of Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeka. They have to be balanced, brother, or Alexander's sister, sister Alexandra. All right. Now, we all want to do what we can do, but there's only a limit to what you can do. If you go and do beyond that limit, then you will suffer. So you need to have wisdom. You know, one of the things um, we used to chit chat about is, oh, people ask a lot of questions. Then I say, oh, don't worry. As they walk the Buddhist path, they will have less questions because as they walk the path, they develop their innate wisdom and their innate wisdom will answer their questions for them. So in the Buddha Dharma, ultimately all of us in walking this path wants to develop Samayana, right insight or right wisdom or right knowledge because that Samayana will lead you to the 10th factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Aha, some of you might be stunned. Are you aware it's not eightfold? It's actually tenfold. The ninth factor is Samayana. The 10th factor is Samavimuti. But Samayana and Samavimuti is not something you can do. You can do the eight. Samayana and Samavimuti is the result of that eight. That's why we walk the Eightfold Path the result of which will be samayana, right, liber uh, right wisdom, right insight, right knowledge, and that will give you right liberation. So then you will not have many questions because you already know how to answer your own question. But until you reach there, you have to realize that you need all the four Brahma Viharas. They have to be balanced, okay? Remember the starfish principle, Sister Alexandra. You cannot save all the starfishes on the beach, but you can save that one that you throw back. So you have mudita for that which you succeed, for that which you have success. And you have upeka for the rest that you can't. And for that upeka, you develop stillness, calmness. All right? Thank you, Dr. Wong. A question from TBCM Facebook from uh, Didi Goseng Huat. Dr. Punia, how do you balance between loving yourself first and yet, in the cost of duty, you are expected to provide selfless service. What is the right mental state for the person in that situation so that he can achieve peace of mind? Well, as I say, Brother Singh Huat, nobody asks you to love yourself any less than your neighbor. You are asked to love yourself and your neighbor. You are asked to say, may I all beings be happy and well. And in fact, in the Theravada tradition, they begin by saying, may I be happy and well. You start with, may I first, then... After that, you go on and extend it further and further. So nobody is first and foremost saying, oh no, you must love yourself less. So that's a misconception. So yes, you want to help people, but you cannot help people if you yourself are in a bad shape. And I think that that is something we recognize. Many of my students who are frontliners, I can see are getting visibly exhausted. And when they become emotionally exhausted, you see that they become less gung-hu, less caring as before. And that is sad because when you see that, you know it's time to rotate them. Someone has to be rotated in to take their place so that they can have a break. And then like Arnold Schwarzenegger say, I'll be back when they are in a better position. So please, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, realize you must first take care of yourself before you can take care of others. You cannot help others when you yourself are an emotional wreck. So while I would say, yeah, of course, we want to help people selflessly in that sense that you're not helping people with thinking of a reward, with thinking of a gain. 
or as Cantonese speakers will say, you may jok so si and mo jok so um jo ga. So we are not along that line. Our selflessness is that we are helping not along the line of prosperity returns. That means I give you 100, uh, I expect some divine being to give me back 1,000, you know. That, that is not what we want. We are talking about a selfless help so that that help is done without expectation of what I will benefit from it. But nobody is saying that you are going to sacrifice yourself and harm yourself in the process. Okay. Good on. Question from BGF, uh, Ching Sing Ling. When you are with a difficult family member who speaks, acts in ways that triggers your irritation, anger, sadness in you, how can you continue to practice without losing your compassion? He or she uses harsh speech. Well, the answer to that is with great difficulty. It is a family member, so it's a bit of a difficult situation. If it is a friend or a colleague, you can walk away. But with a family member walking away is still an option, but it may not be a viable option in many situations because I've seen situations where it's a parent. So how are you going to walk away? So it's, it's difficult. I do not have any one clear cut answer that I can say, here, take this pill, you'll be okay. Because there are too many variables involved. Yes, I agree. There are some family members that can be really very, very destructive and I, I think that the counselors that are in this group will probably have more experience in dealing with this than I have. And yes, I think that if you have a situation like that, my usual advice would be, I think that first, if both the member who is asking the question and the family member is amiable to family counseling, then do see a counselor. Now we have para-Buddhist counselors, BGF has it, even in JB we have it. That means there are counselors which try to apply the principles of Buddhism in their counseling techniques. That may be one way of, of, of solving the problem. Other than that, I, I, I do not see an easy way out because I have heard horror stories of no matter how much meta this person pours onto the other family member, their family member absorbs it all like a sponge. Some work effectively, some doesn't work effectively. And the, this family member continues to be hurt and in many as it times, they actually have to be removed from their very destructive situation. There are counselors within this group. If there is a need, I think that professional help should be sought. All right. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Question from TBCM, Hong, Hong Meng Sheng. Can this topic be applied for those who are working on long hours in other jobs or careers as well? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, now with the Raging COVID, I basically use the medical frontliners as an example. But there are many other people who are also in jobs that are equally demanding. Can, can you imagine somebody working in a befriender? Every phone call he receives is an emotionally challenging phone call. That's why the befrienders have to be well-trained. And of course, they are rotated very frequently. And, you know, even something as simple as... Um, Secure in in Malacca, sending food to old people living alone. I followed Brother Tan once as he went distributing food. And then you see that it is actually very sad. And then you, you find it very challenging. Why, why are these people like that? You know, why, why are their families not doing? And you begin to question, you know, is our society breaking down or is what? And yes, um, I'm never saying that such things are easy. They are not easy. And they're very, very emotionally challenging. Now, Sakai wants to run an animal shelter. Fantastic. But you must have the manpower. If not, you know, the, the, the guy who organized it, the five committee members who are organizing it, and then that's it. And then after a while, you get burnout. And, you know, I spent a lot of time explaining how you recognize that burnout. You know, Dr. Wu, the fundamental part of this talk on compassion fatigue and burnout was about uh, one and a half or two years ago, a, a, a hospital in, in JB actually invited me to give a talk to all their staff with regards to this. And that was how, yeah, I said, this is very important because they were trying to motivate their staff how not to develop compassion fatigue, how not to develop burnout. And without using the word Buddhism, we applied the principles that I've shared. So 
it can be applied to many other fields as well. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm very sure PJ will have a big hospice group somewhere. The people who are volunteering in hospice, for example, all right, they will be facing very demanding situations every day. Yep. Thank you, Bobby. Thank you, Dr. Punia. Another question from TBCM Brother Hai Ing. Compassion must go hand in hand with wisdom. Wisdom will help us to be more compassionate without harming ourselves and others and family. Do you agree? Yes. The two wings, the two wings, wisdom and compassion. All right. You need to have both for the dove of Buddhism to fly. You cannot have one without the other. So I think this is uh, all the questions that we have. Let us uh, now, as Dr. Wong has mentioned, we, this session was uh, is especially dedicated to our Dharma brothers and sisters from Indonesia, uh, brother and uh, those uh, who have uh, uh, passed away recently. So let us do some dedication of merits. Thank you, Dr. Wong, for your sharing. We'd like to dedicate this to the Dhammaduta family in Jakarta, Sister Astrid Monica Jayasiri, and her mother, Ibunda Astrid, and also Madam Ong Siok B, the mother of our sister, Catherine Tan, and to our brother, Chen Xingxiang, who is the uh, son of uh, Didi Ju Seng, just uh, uh, passed away for the first anniversary. Let us do dedication of merits to these people and keep them in mind. We have made the right effort to participate in this Dharma sharing. We renew our faith and refuge in the three jewels and learn to develop wisdom and compassion. May all beings without limit have a share of this merit and in whatever other merit we have made. Those who are near and kind to us, including our mother and father, teachers, friends, relatives, or dearly departed relatives and others, whether neutral or hostile, all sentient beings in the universe, if they know of our dedication and merit, may they rejoice with us. By reason of their rejoicing in our gift of merit, may all beings be free from harm and danger and live with peace and happiness. Let us now make an aspiration. May we meet with wise friends and teachers who guide us along the path of Buddha Dhamma and finally attain the perfect state of Nibbana where all sufferings cease. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs>